On April the 25th, 1963, this man, Joseph Litleider, JCR Litleider, or Lick, to his friends, he wrote a memo to the members and affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. The memo was about an overall enterprise that Litleider himself was at a loss to name. But what he really wanted to do was to get a very small number of incredibly expensive computers that he and his colleagues worked on to talk to each other. It seemed like an almost impossible dream. And indeed, he writes in the memo, he concedes, this might not always be particularly useful. He realises that only on a rare occasions, possibly to most or all of the computers actually operate in this network, they wouldn't always need to have this thing switched on. But if they could crack this, if they could make this work, well, think, he exhorts the readers of this memo, think, he exhorts the members and affiliates of the intergalactic computer network. Think of the scale of hardware that we could throw at common problems. We would have at least four large computers, perhaps six or eight small computers, and a great assortment of disk files and magnetic tape units. But even here, at the very beginning, Litleider and his colleagues knew that from this humble technical beginning, a great number of other beginnings would be created as well. And he wrote sometime later that connecting computers together would allow decisions in the public interest, but also in the interest of giving the public itself the means to enter into the decision-making process that will shape their future. Litleider and his colleagues knew that connecting computers together could change the way that human beings connected with each other. It could change the way that power works. It could change the way that politics works. In other words, the origins of the internet have always been wrapped up in another origin as well the origin of digital democracy. Now, of course, we are all members of Litleider's intergalactic computer network. The internet has spread further and wider and more profoundly and more deeply than, than even Litleider himself could possibly have imagined. So was his prediction right? Has the rise of the internet also seen a rise in a new way of doing politics, a new digital democracy? a new way for people to enter into decision-making process, a new way for them to help shape the institutions and the decisions and, and, and the country around them? Well, my answer is that for most people, most of the time, it really, really, really hasn't. I think it is astonishing how the internet and thinking digitally has changed so much of so many different parts of our lives, from the beliefs that we hold, to where we shop, to how we fall in love. Even who we think we are, the problems that we think are present in society and how we go about solving them, but it's barely changed at all how we live as citizens. It's barely changed at all how we're involved in formal political decision-making. It's barely changed at all the basic way in which we go about democracy. Rather than making us more powerful as citizens, the rise of digital politics stubbornly resisting the beckoning future that Litleider pointed towards, firstly, sometimes makes us, I think, the recipient of just another kind of advertising campaign. So here is a strong commanding performance tweeted the Conservative Central Office Headquarters Twitter account after the leaders' debate during the general election here in the UK last year. No surprises there, of course, they tweet that. Tory Treasury and Ed. Ed's not here anymore, is he? <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> they completely agree. A strong and commanding performance from David Cameron there. Strong and commanding performance from David Cameron. There's another Conservative MP. A strong and commanding performance. Can you guess what the next one's going to be? <laughs> strong commanding performance there from Jim Messina, the Tories pollster. And the Conservative commanding performance from the PM tonight. 
Indeed, kind of the only latitude within this kind of message discipline is almost whether to put a comma between strong commanding in the message before you send it out. So all too often, I think, politicians, rather than telling us what they really think, they echo the same message discipline, the same strict sound bites back at us. Secondly, as we log into digital politics, we sometimes jump in to digital tribes. This is our Twitterverse that we created during the general election. Every dot, every tiny star in the sky is one of hundreds of thousands of different people who somehow got involved in that election, somehow wanted to chip into this big, churning digital debate that was erupting across lots of different social media platforms, including Twitter, to become involved in choosing the political future of the UK. And the location of every tiny dot, of every star in the sky is absolutely no accident at all. Those that follow, that retweet, that see each other's information and tend to share it on, they are close to each other. And those that don't, they tend to be further apart. And of course, as you retweet and follow, or you tend to, people that you agree with rather than you disagree with, especially in the context like this, especially in the context of an election, of course, you form digital tribes. A big, bright Labour tribe there at the front. They were the party of the volunteers, both on the streets and in the digital world. You've got the Tory tribe, you've got a big, bright UKIP cluster. You've got a Scottish conversation happening entirely to, unto itself. Each of these digital tribes sometimes acting like an echo chamber, each reflecting a whirling thousand series of your own beliefs back at you in millions of different ways. And lastly, when there is division on Twitter, all too often it does, and not just Twitter, all social media, all too often it does descend into abuse. This is the favourite swear words thrown from the British electorate to the poor politicians during the general election. Uh, over 100,000 of them overall. But even politicians, with all that message discipline, frayed, anxious, nervous, tired on the campaign trail, well, that even they sometimes lost their temper. And they fired over 1,000 messages back, sometimes to constituents, sometimes to other politicians, sometimes just out of frustration into the digital ether. Now, all of this is political. All of this, I think, is profoundly changing the way that elections are fought. It is profoundly changing and will continue to the way that power is won. And I think there is some good in all of this too. I think that the rise of these big digital political debates are bringing new people into the debate. They are allowing, they are giving people another way of making a say and they are reaching parts of society we've always struggled to reach with politics. But none of this is in a formal sense democratic. None of this is actually changing the way that political decisions are made. None of this is actually influencing the decisions which affect and shape our lives. And regardless, I think we have to remember that power is money on social media platforms and you can use it to be louder than your opponents. And all of this is being carried out anyway. In proprietary spaces, of course, it has to be. It's a lot like having a public debate in a shopping mall. Now, so I don't think, first of all, that this great promise that I just saw right back then, the very beginnings of the internet, I don't think that promise has yet come true. Democracy. Democracy is a lofty idea, an ideal. But like the loftiest of ideas, it has always produced a train of practical challenges. How do you actually put the people in charge? How do you actually capture and express the people's will in decisions that are made? What balances do you have to strike? What powers do you have to create? What boundaries do you have to police to really have a political system with the people in whatever it means, the driving seat? The devil of democracy has always been in the detail of it. And it was detail that we badly needed in 1649 at the origins of our own democracy here in the UK. With the smell of gunpowder smoke still hanging in the air, with our headless king 
Charles I, still on the scaffold. We badly needed a form of democracy that we could actually practically make work. And we faced a huge, huge problem. There were too many people spread over too vast a country, too busy, too ungovernable to directly rule. We needed, to, we needed something else. And the man who had the detail, had the answer, a man now often forgotten, was called Henry Parker. And in giving the detailed, practical answer to how he actually installed democracy, he authored a system of democracy which everyone in this room will, will recognise and which has become to dominate what we understand democracy to mean throughout the world. In this pamphlet, so innocuously titled Observations, he would cause a seismic ripple in political theory, which we live within, we live under every day. People, he reasoned, could rule, could be sovereign, if a parliament was. Parliament was what you needed to represent, to literally represent the nation, but all in one room, conveniently small, able to bait, debate, able to make decisions. In this pamphlet, he argued, that people could rule by electing delegates to rule on their behalf. And so, in making this argument, he expressed and defined what democracy would mean and what democracy would become around the world for large, modern, big countries. Now, people worried about democracy at the time. One of Henry Parker's contemporaries, a man called John Lilburn, another Democrat, he warned Parliament shortly after it was created, for we might justly have done it ourselves, that is, create democracy, without you, without you, Parliament, had we thought it convenient. They worried because they saw it as being a very dangerous means to achieve a very lofty end. And to jump now from 1649 to today, I think John Lilburn was right to worry. Because I think that this system of parliamentary democracy is in deep, deep trouble. And this is because, I think, primarily, alongside the rise of parliaments, we've seen the rise of lots of other things as well. We've seen the rise of political parties, big electoral factories, bureaucratic, organised machines, capable of fighting elections, capable of commanding majorities in parliament. These are machines that need to be funded. So we've seen the rise of big money politics. Donations, sometimes shadowy, sometimes not, sometimes completely legitimate, sometimes more questionable. All of that going to fund not, political, not democracy itself, but the political parties that live within it. And these are political parties that are sometimes staffed by professional politicians, people that choose from an early age to become a politician rather than becoming an accountant, rather than becoming a banker, rather than becoming a lawyer. And these are professional politicians who sometimes come from political dynasties, families that give them the wherewithal, the confidence, the network, the contacts to even think that you can do politics in the first place. And all of this, I think, comes together. All of this comes together to mean that we, the people, are, rather than being the participants in a democracy, often feel and often treated like we are the consumers of it. We are a market that can be sold an idea, a product, once every four or five years come election time. I think too many people in the UK, their only interaction with politics is when an election is on the horizon. And it's a product that fewer and fewer people around the world, I think, are buying anymore. Never before have people felt so distant from their representatives. Never before have people felt so angry with politics. Never before have people trusted less the people that they elect to represent them. Over in the UK, and I think this is unfair, but in the UK, 80% of people don't trust politicians to tell the truth. That is less than bankers. That is less than estate agents. It's the least trusted profession. I think this is a great crisis. I think that the system that we now have of parliamentary democracy is in crisis. Electoral turnout was falling. Political participation is low. It's been dropping since the 1950s. And people are desperately looking for alternatives. They're desperately looking for other ways of changing society, not through formal politics, 
but through other means. And from Podemos to Seritzia to the movement of the Five Stars, we're seeing bushfire insurgencies across Europe desperately looking for alternatives to the mainstream. In fact, from Jeremy Corbyn to Bernie Saunders to, of course, Donald Trump himself, the smart brand for politicians now, almost the only brand for politicians, is to set yourself up against that mainstream. You cannot now run as a politician that represents in any way the mainstream. You have to call for radical reform. You have to position yourself outside of business as usual complacency. I think people are looking for alternatives. I think some of this, whether good or bad, but all of this is deeply, deeply troubling. Now, of course, none of this was part of the plan. When, at the very origins of the internet, when Lit Lider was thinking about how the internet and how technology can change the way in which we make decisions, how it could bring so many more people into the decision-making process, I think he was recalling a kind of democracy before parliaments, a kind of democracy that traces its own origins all the way back to the origins of democracy itself in ancient Athens. And why I think Lick Lider is a visionary, and what I think is desperately true today, is that for perhaps the first time in centuries, parliaments are not the only way of making democracy work. Technology is now allowing a blooming of lots of other ways of achieving that same basic point, that same basic principle of allowing people to have the say over the decisions that affect them. And this is what I think will happen next. I think people will use technology to find other ways of doing democracy, to find other ways of putting people in the driving seat, to create other alternatives to parliamentary democracy, and to move power away from political parties and back to people, to push power downwards after all the centralization of that system. And the first alternative, the most similar to the ancient Athenian assembly, the one I think Lit Lider was really imagining is direct democracy, direct, direct democracy. No delegates, no parliaments, just people directly, constantly voting on decisions. The sheer number of people, their spread across the country, once such massive, massive problems in the 1640s, well, that doesn't matter anymore. And there is a flood of new direct digital democratic platforms that are beginning to make this possible. Now, not many of them are used very much, and it's difficult to know how to use it in a way which is safe. It's certainly difficult to know how to plug it into the systems that we already have. But I think demand for some kind of direct democracy using technology will continue to grow, and I think it's only a matter of time now. Sooner or later, one of these platforms, in one way, is going to be plugged into a decision-making process that really matters. But then secondly, the internet hasn't made anyone less busy. And now votes can flow around a system, thanks to technology, as easily as information or money does. So we have liquid democracy, where you can pass your vote on defence policy to someone that you trust. You could pass your vote on economic policy to someone else, and maybe they pass their votes to you on an issue that you care deeply about, on an issue that you follow closely, environmental policy. All these votes flowing around fluidly, organically, within a system that can be revoked at any time. And how is this for a final radical idea? Bitcoin democracy. Of course, I don't think this audience of any would have any problem in understanding how this might work. People are developing technology to cut out not only parliaments, not only delegates, but the states themselves. Using the underlying technology of Bitcoin blockchain to allow networks to come together where there's no middleman where there's no superintendary authority, where there's no centralization of power, where everyone in the network makes sure that everyone else is following the rules. And people applying this technology to allow people to become citizens of virtual nations. Nations with land titles, with citizenship, with voting rights, even embassies. But a democracy taken completely outside of the geographical space and most perfectly put into Lit Lider's intergalactic computer network. Now, we don't know which of these is going to work. Reinventing democracy is not easy. It is incredibly difficult indeed. 
We, these systems will be open to manipulation. They'll be subject to abuse. We don't know how to stop them in systems that we have. We don't know all the risks and pitfalls which are attendant on it. But I think from Litleider's origin to today, I think the best of the internet has always been about innovation. Of course it has. It's always been about reinvention. It's always been about never accepting the legacies which we inherit. It's always been about interrogating the institutions that we have and thinking about whether we can improve them. And I think we now stand on an incredibly exciting moment of doing that again. I only wish, and I, and I say this coming from a political think tank rather than the tech world, I only think that we can start thinking digitally, not just about marketing, not just about jobs, not just about skills, but actually thinking digitally about something which, like it or not, affects everyone in this room, like it or not, underlies the very worlds which we live in, like it or not, uh, contains and frames and drives the most important decisions which we will collectively ever take together. Decisions of war, decisions of peace, decisions of life, decisions of death. I think it is really time to start thinking digitally about politics. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me.